Hello, thank you for your interest in joining today for this talk on delirium care in the time of COVID. I'm Hazel Miller, a geriatrician in Glasgow, but our multidisciplinary delirium group has contributed to the content. So, just to be clear, this talk applies to all acute areas other than intensive care, which have their very own skilled ways of managing delirium and delirium risk. It's been put together by a group of disciplines and therefore is suitable for all disciplines. I hope everyone can get something out of it. It applies to delirium care in the time of COVID and some of this will be for people who have COVID and some of it will be for people who don't, but who are subject to the same infection control restrictions as all our hospitals are at the moment. And as a practical rather than a theoretical talk, I hope it will give some advice and some tips for specific situations. We're really keen to hear your thoughts or enter into some discussion, so please feel free to email either myself or Sandra Shields or Alzheimer's Scotland Dementia Nurse Consultant on the email addresses provided. So going back and thinking at the start of the pandemic, as we prepared, we were all expecting to see people with the classical symptoms, cough, fever and hypoxia. Those of us looking after the frail elderly, however, quickly saw that, as with all illnesses, many of our patients presented in a non-specific way with a more global decline and very many with delirium. At the same time, our colleagues working in intensive care and critical care were seeing really high rates of delirium in the very unwell patients that they were looking after. It would be strange if we were not seeing more delirium in a disease which causes hypoxia and inflammation increases the number of critically ill patients and disproportionately affects older, frailer people who are more vulnerable to delirium. In the incredible reorganisation we have seen to manage the crisis, people are looked after in very different ways than they were before. Patients may be stepped down from intensive care to other areas more quickly to make the best use of resources. And traditionally, medical patients are often cared for in other areas. Unfortunately, hospital here in the pandemic is especially high risk for delirium between the PPE, which sometimes makes staff look less human, the loss of continuity of care in the background of staffing pressures as staff self-isolate or move to where the need is greatest in that day, multiple ward moves for patients as infection control procedures are maintained, and probably most significantly of all, not being able to see the loved ones. On top of all this, there's a possibility that there are factors specific to COVID related to inflammation or hypoxia, which may make it more likely to cause delirium than other severe illnesses. And people coming in are coming in in a background of a lockdown where they have lost social support, may be exercising less and may be coming from a lower baseline function. So dealing with these high rates and severities of delirium that all these factors contribute to can feel very daunting. But the good news, if we can call it that, is that good delirium care in the pandemic isn't materially different to good delirium care in any other time, alibi with some extra challenges and adaptions. We use the same principles and strategies that we already have learnt. So in the time of COVID-19, we still use time to prompt good delirium care. Now, if you wish, you can refresh your knowledge with a visit to our CKP site via the QR code, our learning module by the web link at the bottom, or if you're on a GGC computer, you can visit our StaffNet site. To quickly recap our processes, all high-risk people at the front door get screened with a 4AT and have a multi-component risk reduction intervention prompted by Part T, triggers of time and active care. Their mental state is then monitored for emergent delirium with a single question in delirium as part of their active care throughout their stay. If they develop delirium at any point, a multi-component treatment intervention is prompted by all four parts of time, T for triggers, I for investigations, M for management and E for explain and explore. Now we have the news too. This gives another opportunity to monitor for delirium with the D column, patients scoring for new confusion or her decreased level of consciousness. 
And here we have our timesheet, hopefully very familiar to all in GGC, showing all the components of the time checklist. With assessment, it's important to have a really high index of suspicion to keep the idea of delirium in your mind. From the first time the person is assessed, if it's considered early, then it's in the differentials and it's more likely to be followed up on all the way through their stay. And if you don't know, you can write down query delirium. It should be treated as a medical emergency, as a new delirium could be the first sign of someone becoming extremely unwell. Is it an indication that your COVID patient has become hypoxic? As a rule of thumb, I would always remember that people who are unwell with COVID need to be assessed for delirium and people who have delirium need to be assessed for COVID. Remembering that in the frail elderly, delirium may be the only presenting feature. Moving on to risk reduction and management of delirium, these are both done via multi-component interventions. Currently, the high delirium rates and the challenges in care that we see with no visitors in the deliriumogenic environment mean that we need to do all we can to reduce the risk of delirium, which is associated with at least a twofold increase of mortality. Remember that risk reduction strategies have previously been shown to reduce delirium risk by about a third. When we are looking for risk or causative factors, we need to expect complexity. A person with a delirium may be unwell with a COVID infection, be hypoxic, they may be dehydrated from loss of taste, have poor oral intake from thrush, be immobile as they're on their oxygen, be constipated, have an associated urinary retention, etc. etc. If we address them as prompted in part two of time, we are reducing risk. If the person has already developed a delirium, we continue to address these triggers, but also to pay attention to I for investigations, M for management of all the causes that we have found, and E for explaining and exploring. When we diagnose delirium, it's critical that we name it so that these actions are completed and explain it to both the patient and their family. Now, person-centred care, as ever, is the key to good delirium care. We should really strive to know our patients even better than they normally would, as with no visiting allowed for most of our patients, we are their connection to the outside world. We can get information about them via the Getting to Know Me forms. We can help facilitate meaningful activity. Phones and devices are absolutely invaluable for this at the moment. Therapy sessions in particular are really beneficial. They can have personal items dropped off via the Give and Go service run by our fabulous volunteers. We can use any episode of care, such as washing or blood taking, to have a meaningful interaction with the person. Despite the stresses of our jobs at this difficult time, it's worth remembering that we have the privilege of face-to-face -face contact with people that is denied to so many others. And it is this human contact and connection which often brings meaning and satisfaction to our working lives. Okay, so I'm now going to move on to some of the practicalities of the factors we look at in delirium care, both in risk reduction and in management. Now, pain should always be considered for patients with or at risk of delirium. Do they have something sore? Being in bed for a prolonged period of time makes most people sore and patients coming out of ITU who have been prone can really have high levels of pain. Sometimes pain isn't reported well and can present as more of a behavioural disturbance or distress. If this is a worry, you can think about using the Abbey Pain Scale or trying a strong analgesic and assess assessing a response. Sometimes there's a reluctance to use opiates due to concern about them worsening a delirium. But remember that uncontrolled pain itself is terrible for delirium and it's important that we relieve distressing symptoms for our patients. If someone's reacted badly to morphine before, you could try oxycodone as an alternative and it's also very useful in patients with some renal impairment. And constipation isn't glamorous in any way, but it's absolutely fundamental to care of the very ill or frail person and fundamental to delirium care. Bowels are usually more of an issue if someone's not eating or walking and they might not be able to use the toilet so they're in lots of oxygen or respiratory support. Bowel care can be especially difficult for people in CPAP as they can struggle to drink laxatives due to having the mask on. So 
management of constipation needs a coordinated, slightly obsessive and multidisciplinary approach in delirium care. So oral intake has a whole side to itself because it's a huge one in COVID care. I found oral thrush almost ubiquitous in the patients I've looked after and it can compound the loss of sense and taste that they experience as a result of the COVID. By the time you add in a dry and ulcerated mouth from high flow oxygen or CPAP, you have so many problems. Then in delirium, people can lose the drive to eat and drink, compounding the delirium and the situation. And this can be a prolonged situation. So really good attention to mouth care and frequent pumping of fluids are key. As most of the time families can't be there to feed them, we can ask them to help in other ways by dropping off things they particularly like to eat or drink. It's worth trying sweet things and anecdotally that can sometimes help. Cool foods may be more palatable than warm if there's altered taste and making the food taste stronger by adding pepper, sauces, herbs or spices can give some flavour. It's really important that a person-centred and individualised approach is taken to nutrition and hydration and we often get support from the dietitian for this. For some patients this will be the use of oral nutritional supplements or subcut fluids. For other patients it can be the use of short-term artificial tube feeding. Now when it comes to drugs, medication review in delirium means reducing polypharmacy where possible as well as cutting down on medications which cause specific concern. And the ones we worry about are the usual suspects. We think about benzodiazepines, um, we think about analgesics, we think about anticholinergics in particular. The things like tricyclics and oxybutynin, hyacine is always one to watch out for as is often prescribed for secretions but also the cumulative effects of less obviously anticholinergic medications. You might want to think about using one of the tools, such as the anticholinergic cognitive burden tool, which has an easy to use online calculator and gives you an indication of an anticholinergic burden. It's also worth remembering that some medications need weaned and withdrawal can be a problem. Of course, in COVID care, the dexamethasone used is another one which can raise a lot of concern. Personally, I've seen less in the way of hyperactive delirium than I might have expected with it. However, it does occur and can be problematic, in which case we can, can consider stopping or cutting the dose. And of course, raised blood sugars go hand in hand with the dexamethasone use. Our diabetologist colleagues have been kept extremely busy helping advise on this. The guidelines they've produced in diabetes control will on steroids have been really helpful for this situation. A couple of things I would be particularly mindful of in delirium, one of which is the effect of a VRII in a delirium risk or maintenance for a person, as you're really committing to hourly wakening for blood sugar testing and being attached to a drip. And it's also worth thinking of the risk of hypoglycemia in hypoactive delirium if oral intake is reduced. From a sensory point of view, it's absolutely vital to use hearing aids and glasses and make sure that the patients can get the best possible cues from their environment, which can already be so hard to make sense of. It's always worth checking if the hearing aid batteries are working or as the person's ears are full of wax, causing a conductive deafness. With mobility, it's important to remember that prompting this will aid delirium risk reduction and management as well as their general recovery by utilising meaningful activity and physical exercise. People who have been very unwell may have really significant weaknesses that need to be worked with. Are they able to do an active range of movement in bed? Are they able to sit on the side of the bed? Are they able to stand to go and sit in a chair? Or are they able to walk? Physiotherapists and occupational therapists are of course really key to this process, but it's important that all key members help promote mobility and movement as much as possible. Now looking after really sick people often involves a lot of lines, catheters, venous cannulas, other indwelling devices, monitors, all of which can cause a prolonged delirium. They should really be removed as soon as it is safe to do so. It might be worth challenging or considering in the ward rounds, are they still needed or does the risk now outweigh the benefits? Sometimes it might be worth considering if a pick line would help. It can certainly be kinder and easier for the patient. 
And another really challenging one is sleep. The sleep-wake cycle is so important in delirium care, but it can be a real challenge to promote sleep hygiene in critical care areas or indeed in any other ward. Being thoughtful about checking observations and administering medications overnight, dimming lights and quieting, quieting alarms where safe can all help. It's worth considering if the person could use eye masks or earplugs. We can also aim to keep the person awake and stimulated as much as possible during the day to avoid them getting into a pattern of day-night reversal. Communication orientation is again a real challenge with the restrictions that we have, but promoting this will help reduce and manage delirium. It's often possible to FaceTime either on the patient's own phone or perhaps using a device that the virtual patient-centred visiting scheme have provided or sometimes a simple phone call with their relatives. Families are probably going to be very anxious about their loved ones, especially if they've picked up on delirium symptoms. And it's worth making sure they're kept up to date and have a diagnosis of the delirium explained to them. You might want to signpost them to the Scottish Delirium Association's website, which has a patient and care information leaflet that they can access over the internet. We should always remember that patients might forget where they are I might take the opportunity to remind them where they are and what is happening at every opportunity. Let them know they are in hospital and what your job is before carrying out any care may also help prevent frightening them. Having calendars and clocks clearly visible will help. If the person has a cognitive impairment, they might forget why you are wearing PP or why their relatives are not able to visit and reassurance about this can be very helpful. I've certainly had quite a few of my own patients feel very abandoned at the fact that their relatives weren't up visiting. Unfortunately, some of our patients will experience stress and distress. And as before, non-pharmacological techniques remain the mainstay of care. Treating precipitating factors, de-escalation, distraction with activities, speaking to family, and then remember that an essential visitor in this circumstance may become an option. Pharmacological treatment is considered for if these techniques fail and there's either severe distress, danger to others or danger to the patient themselves, including being unable to accept necessary care. Now it's really easy to see how this might occur in situations where help is required for breathing support, whether they're needing oxygen or CPAP. And for, in this case, you need clear thinking as to the benefit and burden to the patient. It's also easy to see how infection control issues may fall under these categories, whether to protect a patient or staff or others from exposure. We might find that we're needing to consider pharmacological therapies in situations where we wouldn't have previously. The BGS, the British Geriatric Society, has given some really good clear advice on this, which is worth looking at if you find yourself in this situation. Now, as we come towards the end of the talk, I thought it was worth a few notes on delirium in the COVID HDU. Now, the principles here are the same as screening, risk reduction, identification and multi-component interventions along with communication. But there are added difficulties as HDU care is even more deliriumogenic than other areas care. There is a whole extra layer of infection control, including the full PPE worn by all staff, high levels of noise and light, which can be up to 24 hours a day, having a CPAP mask on and the restrictions of mobility, which may be associated with that, combined with the critical illness itself, makes COVID HDU a very high delirium risk area. Patients, they are often there for some time and take a huge physiological hit, but means that delirium is incredibly likely, especially in those with less reserve. And people might be given morphine and midazolam infusions to help with the tolerability of the CPAP, but it can still be a real challenge, and these drugs themselves can promote delirium or, or prevent it from settling. It's worth thinking about the fact that people who are struggling cognitively may find high dependency care very difficult to manage. And this is one of the factors that should play into the individualised escalation plans that we make for all our patients. And my last practical point is about what happens when you have delirium that doesn't settle. 
it's become apparent that some people with COVID have a prolonged hypoactive delirium, which can be very difficult to distinguish from someone coming to the end of their life. And of course, this can be very difficult, especially for the loved ones. I found that the best approach is to try and describe the uncertainty to the relatives and as ever to take a person-centred approach. What would they want? What are their values? What might their life look if they did survive and how would they feel about that? Bearing this in mind, we can support as best appropriate. Some patients require an NG, more often it is a matter of subcut fluids and oral intake as they are awake enough to take. It's really important to ensure good symptom control in this situation, including use of subcut medications or syringe drivers as needed and close attention as ever to bowel care. If we try and keep an open mind, with time the trajectory will declare itself. So to summarise, despite all the changes and adaptations we've made over this past year, good delirium care in the time of COVID is done along the same principles as it was before. And in GGC we use time to prompt it. We may be doing more delirium care, but our underlying strategies and techniques remain the same. And finally, I thought it would be good to take a moment to talk about being kind. Now, this is one of the cliches of the pandemic, but cliches are cliches for a reason. Of course, we are kind to our patients, but we also need to be to our colleagues and even more importantly, to ourselves. Everything we have done this past year has been turned upside down. We are working in new and ever-changing situations in terms of staffing, procedures, physical spaces, equipment, hospital visiting, in a way that we've never done before. It can sometimes feel incredibly frustrating that we're not able to do everything the way we are used to doing it or would like to do it. And I very much include delirium and care in that. A lot of what we do seems at times of suboptimal and we feel we're frequently making difficult compromises. Don't underestimate how hard this is, but also how very important it is. It is by making these pragmatic compromises that we get the best care we can for our patients in a very challenging set of circumstances.